Good morning. Good to see everybody brave this blustery wind out here to meet with us this morning. Let's begin our worship by turning to hymn number 727. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe in veils below let all our strength be hurled faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world faith is the victory faith is the victory oh glorious victory that overcomes the world his banner over us is love our sword the word of god we tread the road the saints above with shouts of triumph fraud by faith they like a whirlwind's breath swept on o'er every field the faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given, before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then loudward from the hills of light our hearts with love aflame. He'll vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. I'm going to let you be seated for just a moment, if you will. Something that uh, maybe we have not done for a while. Um, is to take a moment just to share some blessings uh, or some praises, some giving of thanks uh, to the Lord. And so before we pray this morning, I thought we might just take a moment and do that. So I'm going to encourage you to um, share something that the Lord has blessed you with this past week or even if you have a concern that we could pray about, we'll invite you to do that. So it's just us uh, home folks today. Uh, let's take a moment and do that. Just uh, if you will stand where you are so everybody can hear you or be seated if you want to. But just uh, let's just share these things. Amen. All right. Glad of that. Thank you. Karen. We got time to wait, so uh, take time off the sermon. You'll be uh, you'll be all right. So, uh, a praise, a, a thanksgiving. Uh, you know, the wind is blowing, and we know that, but it's not snowing, not here anyway. It is it is in some other places, but we do have things to give thanks for. So, someone else. Triple blessing. All right. Thank you. God is so good. <coughs> I just said God is so good. Um, thank you for that. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with one of these. Uh, the church is the 
way that we celebrate and worship Jesus Christ because it's his fault. And if we ignore, and our families ignore the church, we're kind of letting everything go to pieces. So I pray that the people in our community that have a, a concern about anything good would come back and, and get involved in the Lord's work through this church and that way we feel like we're doing something good. You can do all kinds of good things outside the church and it's well and good, but it's so much better if it's done inside the church. Amen. Body of Christ. Thank you. I'm thankful that the Lord was with a friend of mine, Jerry and Carolyn Watts. They were in the tornado that happened here, what, two weeks ago? Anyway, that's the second tornado that has hit their home, and they have survived with no basement. And so I know the Lord was with them, and he spared them. And so that shows we have a, a mighty Lord. All right, thank you. Anyone else? All right, well, now let's pray, if you will, join me. And Father, you've heard these words, these expressions of praise and thanksgiving um, spoken from the depths of our hearts. We do give you thanks, Lord, for blessings that you have showered upon us. There are adversities, we know. There is life, there is death. There is birth, there is, uh, there is the daily grace that you give to us, and we are so in need of it. We confess to you, Lord, that um, like the disciples, sometimes we have to pray, God, um, increase our faith. Um, but we know, Lord, that even though sometimes we are people of little faith, we are people so blessed, and we want you to hear it from our own lips that we thank you and praise you for all the good things that you have given to us. And above all things, uh, for our salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, for the church as the body of Christ, the, the body of believers, the fellowship of caring and sharing and faith that um, that we have and how we may build each other up and pray for one another and uh, God it's uh, it's such a privilege to do so and so on this windy day we do give you thanks and pray that uh, the breath of God the wind of the Holy Spirit would be in our midst even this hour as we worship you in spirit and in truth how we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.
Now you can greet one another, if you would. Take just a moment and shake hands with somebody. Tell them you're glad to see them in the Lord's house today. if we could find our seats. Let's continue our worship this morning by turning to hymn number 437. Number 437, we'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. There's a call comes ringing O'er the restless waves Send the line, send the line there are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let us shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let us shine forevermore. We have heard the Macedonian call. Send the light, send the light, and the golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. Let us grow so weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let us shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. And then turning back one page to hymn number 436, we'll sing both verses. <clears throat> Come 
God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his love as he built me to be said. Freely, freely you have received. Freely, freely. Go in my name and because you believe, others will know that I live. And power is given in Jesus' name. In earth and heaven, in Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name, I come to you to share His love as He told me to. He said, freely, freely, you have received, freely, freely. I'll be reading this morning from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3, beginning with verse 8. <clears throat> Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he that will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be always ready to give an defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. May we continue our worship by turning to hymn number 446, verses 1, 3, and 4. We've a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light, a story of peace and light. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth, the kingdom of love and light. We've a message to give to the nations that the Lord who reigneth above hath sent us His Son to save us and show us that God is love and show us that God is love. For the 
the dark death shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth, the kingdom of love and light. We've a Savior to show to the nations who the path of sorrow hath thread. The whole of the world's great peoples might come to the truth of God, might come to the truth of God. For the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth, the kingdom of love and light. And for our last hymn this morning, let's turn to hymn number 511. Number 511, verses 1, 2, and 4. <laughs> Who can cheer the heart like Jesus by his presence all divine? True tender, pure, and precious, oh, I'm blessed to call him mine. All oh, that thrills my heart is Jesus, he is more than life to me, and the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. Love of Christ so freely given, grace of God beyond degree, mercy higher than the heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. All that thrills my heart is Jesus, He is more than life to me. Lord, I see every need his hand supplying, every need in him I see on the strength divine relying, he is all in all to me. All that thrills my heart is Jesus, he is more than life to me. Ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. you ladies.
I went to three funerals this week, beginning with uh, the one for Steve here at, at our church on Monday and, and two more. <clears throat> they were, I hope, uh, each expressions of our faith, the things that we hold deeply, uh, that we build our lives upon. Hopefully they were an encouragement to the families that uh, were grieving over the loss of a loved one. The last one I went to was unusual in some ways and, and, and very special uh, thought to me. It was uh, the funeral for the wife of a black pastor, a man that I've known for many years, Lou Ballanton. Maybe some of you would know him from Plainview in the Postal Department for many years. The um, friend of mine also who brought the message that day, Matthew Veals from Tulia, mentioned the fact that for 41 years, um, Lou Ballanton's wife, Mrs. Ballanton, had uh, assisted her husband, had accompanied him every Sunday, 41 years, uh, traveling from Plainview to Morton, Texas, where he was pastor of a black uh, church there. And uh, he spoke of what a blessing she was to him and to the church and to many others. But as I sat in that service and uh, observed a multitude of black faces, white faces, a uh, mixture of ethnic uh, backgrounds and it suddenly occurred to me, you know, uh, maybe there is hope for our country uh, because I saw in, um, in that gathering of pastors, uh, of which there were a multitude of black pastors coming together to share with their fellow minister and support him and to be a part of the service. Uh, they have their own unique way of doing things, which... Uh, uh, is, I thought, uh, quite good, quite appropriate, uh, reading scripture and praying and sharing uh, various uh, aspects of support. And then I, after the service is over, to see uh, people hugging one another, uh, speaking words of encouragement and hope and faith and support, uh, I thought, uh, you know, here's where our hope is, uh, in our churches, in our convictions in our faith and maybe uh, maybe there's still hope that God is going to use um, use us uh, as his people to uh, bring a new balance of faith to our nation to our communities and certainly uh, we have that uh, that hope here in our midst and hopefully we can share it with others it was a great blessing to me well, I have a text for you uh, this morning from Acts chapter 1. Uh, if you'd like to turn there, we pick up in verse 4, and we'll read just a few verses. Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. These are the words of Jesus when on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave this command, Do not leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid him from their sight. The spread of the gospel that took place in those early years after the resurrection of Christ was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, an early church historian says that it spread like wildfire fire, uh, with a West Texas wind behind it, uh, beginning at Jerusalem to Judea, Samaria, and then out to the ends of the known earth. 
at that time from 12 disciples to 120 in the upper room to 3,000 on the day of Pentecost to then 5,000 mentioned in Acts 4.4 and then multiplied more after that. The number of followers just continued to increase very rapidly. How is it possible that the gospel in that first century spread so quickly? One of the early church historians says there were several conditions that uh, made it possible for that to happen. One of those was what we call the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, although it was a, an imposed peace because of the might of Rome, still it was effective in the sense that there weren't uh, groups fighting each other all the time. They were in, in an imposed peace because Rome insisted it be that way. There was also uh, the Roman roads because uh, they were well known for building roads throughout their kingdom, which made transportation and movement from place to place uh, much easier. And then there was communication because they had the Greek language that had been uh, shared through under Alexander the Great and in subsequent times uh, Greek culture became very uh, prominent throughout the region and the Greek language was uh, like English today. It was, it was a trade language and almost everyone knew it. But most importantly of all, the way the gospel spread in that first century so effectively and so widely, so quickly, was the power of witnesses. Saved people just sharing their testimony of faith, the experience that they had had. Some of them were still alive who had seen the risen Lord himself, and they told their story over and over and over again. Uh, sometimes persecution that began in Jerusalem scattered them out to different places. Of course, all of those visitors to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, as they went home, they would have shared what they saw, what they experienced when they were in Jerusalem. Still, I think, one has to ask the question, why isn't it that way today? We have more evidence of our faith. We have more people sharing their faith or with uh, people who are saved at least. And, and yet um, our experience today seems to be so much less than what they had in the first century. So we would ask the question maybe, how was it there their witness was so much more powerful than our witness. And um, I think maybe this uh, scripture today will give us some reason to understand why that might be so and why it might be different. The scriptures uh, tell us some things about how we could be a more powerful witness for Jesus and certainly our world needs that today. Witnesses. First of all, let me just mention that uh, our text says that witnesses have a very special commission from the Lord. Um, Jesus said in verse 8, you will be my witnesses. And so here is a very personal relationship that he says, you belong to me. Well, they had been purchased by his shed blood uh, they were his by redemption. They were, as the scriptures say, bought with a price, as we are today as well. So it could mean ownership. They belonged to him. Witnesses belong to Jesus. And uh, then there's another thought that they also were witnesses to him. My witnesses means that they were talking about Jesus. They were witnessing about Jesus. Uh, Jesus. They were just sharing their relationship with him. So both of those things, I think, are implied in that word, my witnesses. Ownership, uh, as well as the fact that they were witnessing to him and about him. That was so much of what they did in their daily experience of life. Now, by this time, you know, he had already said to them those words at the end of Matthew's gospel when he said, All authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Uh, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. We know that uh, those verses, very familiar to us, we call them the Great Commission. There was an authority that was shared in that commission. He said, um, uh, my all authority is given unto me, therefore, based on that, go and make disciples. It was an assignment. They were to be obedient to his commandment. And they must do this for him because they belong to him and he was commanding them to do it. It was also an assurance because he said, I will be with you all the days, literally all the days uh, of this age. Well, um, I wonder though if maybe we might have forgotten um, how important this assignment is. Uh, Jesus gave this assignment and we've long ago decided he didn't mean just those first 12 or those first few that were his followers, but these words were meant for all believers of all ages. And so this should have been something that we understood as a commandment given to us as well. And I wonder maybe if we just might have forgotten to do our homework on occasion. He gave us an assignment and uh, we, uh, we neglected uh, to do it. Scholars have long told us, you know, that the only command really in the Great Commission is not the word go. Um, we might have naturally assumed that because he said go and make disciples, but really the only commandment is the word make disciples. That's the command. That's the word that's in the imperative. The word go literally could be translated and probably should be as in this sense, as you are going, as you are going, make disciples. Now that's a particularly pertinent to us because we are a going people. We don't stay home much, do we? We've got to go here, we've got to go there. So what he's saying, I think, literally is, as you are going to work, as you are going to school, as you're going to Walmart, as you're going to the shops, as you are going to Lubbock or to Amarillo or on vacation or wherever you to go, then as you're going, just make disciples. Just be a witness. Just tell what it means to you. We are to be salt and light, as Jesus said, and a fragrance that will attract people to Christ. So, I wonder if we don't have to ask ourselves what has sealed our lips in terms of being a witness or of sharing our faith? Is it we're afraid? Is it we're intimidated? Um, or is it we forgot? You know, the next time you have an occasion maybe to chide your child or your grandchild about forgetting to do their homework, uh, maybe we ought to think about the fact that we might have forgotten to do our homework or we forgot to do the assignment that Jesus gave to us. Now, I'm not talking about uh, high-pressure salesmanship. We're all turned off by that. You know, and this business about being a soul winner scares us all to death. You know, we are afraid to talk to somebody about their eternal soul. Are you saved, brother? Uh, do you know you're going to heaven? Are you concerned about going to hell. Well, that turns a lot of people off, and we're afraid to do it anyway. Uh, but you know what I think he's talking about here is just simply uh, just talking about what's very real and precious to us. What has Jesus done for you in recent days? How has he blessed your life? Why are you so fortunate uh, as to have the good things that God has given to you? How is it that he gives you peace in times of turmoil? So we're just talking about fulfilling this commission by being natural, just sharing God's good things and giving a word of testimony in the daily experiences 
of life. Um, that should not be an affront to anyone because you're just saying what's real to me. Nobody can tell you that's not so because you know it's real. It's been real in your life. So because as witnesses we have this special relationship with Jesus, it just sort of ought to come naturally. But there's another important thing, very significant and important thing, and that is that witnesses are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that's, uh, that's very real as well. Jesus said in verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. When you tell your story, you're doing it with an unseen but very real sense of meaning and purpose and power. Maybe you didn't realize how real that power is. It's like a fire, a fire uh, burning inside you. And as you speak the words, the Holy Spirit puts a flame to those words so that they burn their way into people's memories and minds and they will think on it in time to come. So Jesus had said to them, just back in the few verses earlier, he says, wait for this, don't leave Jerusalem yet, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you've heard me speak about. Uh, you will be baptized, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that um, it's very unfortunate. We as Baptists are a little bit afraid of the Holy Spirit. Somehow or another, we, we got... Uh, a little bit concerned about excesses we saw there in years past, and uh, so uh, we just a little bit afraid of the power that the Holy Spirit uh, has in a believer's life and in our world. But if you're a believer in Christ, you have that power, and you just have to open your mouth to use it. Now, I know that... Um, you know, we all say this very commonly, you know, my life will be my witness. And so we try to get away with that, that it's good enough for me just to live my life and others will see it, and oh boy, when they see it in me, they're going to fall down on their knees and confess that God is real. Not so, usually, because there are lots of good people in the world. There are lots of people who don't beat their wives and beat their kids. There are lots of people who will do something good for a friend or a neighbor. Uh, you know, so somewhere along the line, a witness has to do more than just live a good life. Somewhere you've got to be able to say, my friend, do you know the Lord Jesus? Uh, what's eternity going to be like for you? Somewhere there has to be a verbal testimony to God's saving grace, I think, if we're going to be obedient as witnesses. I have two English teacher daughters, both with master's degrees, uh, one in high school, one in college. They tell me that the ultimate unforgivable sin in academics is plagiarism, taking somebody else's work and uh, taking it as your own without giving credit to the source. It can get you an F in your course. It can even get you kicked out of school. It is such a serious kind of thing uh, in the world of academics. So let me ask this question. Are we not guilty of plagiarism if we take God's blessings that he gives to us so freely and act like that uh, they just came out of the blue or we just deserved them somehow or they're just ours and we don't give credit to the source from which they came. Why are we so blessed? Because God has blessed us. And why do we have breath and why are we able to be here today? Because God has been so good to us to give us the strength to be here and he's given us his grace and forgiven our sins and so we need to give glory to whom glory is is due while i was a missionary in africa i was told about a legendary local figure a minister of the gospel 
uh, a native man who was so powerfully used of God that uh, oftentimes uh, he, people would come to him who had some kind of physical illness or ailment. He would pray for them and they would be healed. Or he would preach the gospel and many people would respond and, uh, and they would be saved. And of course, uh, many people just heaped praises upon this man and, you know, and thanked him profusely when they had been healed or saved or so you know, good things had come to them. And, uh, but he was always very careful to do this one thing. And he would always say, take your glory, Lord. And so must, me, must we, you know, be careful that God gets his glory. If the Lord doesn't get his glory and the people don't get the story, it's because somehow or another we as witnesses have failed uh, to witness in the power of the Holy Spirit. Someone has said witnessing is just uh, uh, telling the, the story of Jesus and leaving the results to God. And that's very much, we cannot be responsible for how people respond, but we can be responsible for how we share the blessings and the beautiful name of our Lord and Savior. Well, that's the second thing then, we, we as witnesses, we have this special relationship and this assignment from Jesus. We have the power of the Holy Spirit. But then our Lord just reminded us of one thing we need to remember, and that is witnesses must leave some things to the authority of the Father. Oh, how easily we get sidetracked into side issues, into arguments over semantics or dates or times or things like that. And so these disciples right here in the midst of some of the most profound promises that Jesus ever gave to them, came up with this question in verse 6. They asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you at this time going to make uh, Israel great again like it was under the Davidic kingship? And, um, and so uh, he said to them in verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Times or dates, that's the words chronos and kairos. That's clock time and calendar time. Remember several years ago, I was pastor at uh, First Baptist Ropesville. There was a, a, a pamphlet came out, came in the mail. I didn't ask for it, but it just came like a lot of those things do. It was titled... 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Again in 1988. I guess they were all wrong because it didn't happen. He didn't come. But, you know, we get up in, we get involved in those kind of discussions. The Lord coming this year, next year, now, later. What has to happen before the Lord comes? Are the signs here? Are the signs there? You know, it's so easy to um, get sidetracked. And there are a lot of things we don't know. A lot of things we can leave safely in the hands of the Father. But we need to keep our focus because this is so important. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. We know by experience what Jesus has done in our lives. We know that it is by his shed blood that we have been forgiven of our sins. We know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so every one of us has an assignment from Jesus. And it isn't a difficult assignment. It's just simply to tell the story, to be a witness, and depend on the power of the Holy Spirit to make it effective. Well, you know, uh, ever since I uh, came to be your pastor, that's been, what, about nine months now. Uh, most Sundays we sing praises, we, uh, we look at the scriptures, and I kind of leave it with you to meditate on, to think about, to do with it what you will, mostly just to think about it and, uh, and to be something that uh, 
the scriptures encourage you to be. What I'm going to do today is a little different. I'm going to challenge you to do something. To decide today that in this coming week, you will ask the Lord to give you the courage to be a verbal witness. And I'm not talking about uh, just going out and collaring somebody and saying, let me give you the Roman road or the four spiritual laws. I'm talking about any opportunity that the Holy Spirit reveals to your mind, your heart, where you could speak a word of encouragement in the name of your Savior, Jesus. Would you do that? Would you look for that opportunity and uh, maybe ask the Lord to open your mouth and give you some words to say so that your testimony is more than just a life lived, but it is actually a confession made, a word spoken um, from the mouth, that, that you actually say something for your Lord as a witness. So what does this proverb say? A word fitly spoken is like... Uh, apples of gold or something to that effect, I don't know. Would you pray with me about that? Father, uh, we wonder sometimes if we forgot our homework assignment, if we just assumed that if we um, ignored it and went on and lived a good life, it would be enough. But what we see from these early Christian witnesses is that they would not be silenced even by the whip by the threat of the sword, by persecution, they could not be silenced. There was a flame that burned within that, that had to be released, and so they spoke boldly in the name of Jesus. God forgive us that uh, it seems like there's not much boldness in us anymore. The boldness seems to be among the, uh, the detractors, the demonstrators, uh, but not among your people. So God, uh, I'm asking you this uh, day to help me to be unafraid to use my voice and to speak words of kindness, encouragement, uh, of assistance, of whatever way, but to do it in the name of Jesus as I share what he has done for me. Father, uh, touch our hearts and uh, help us to open our mouths and then give us words to say by the indwelling power of your Holy Spirit. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.